بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My dear brothers and sisters, welcome to another episode in our series on the journey to the afterlife. We spoke about the stages of death and the journey of the soul after death. We spoke about the day of resurrection, Yom al Qiyamah. We spoke about hellfire and the traps of shaitan that lead to the hellfire. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you and I from the traps of shaitan. And then we started describing the beautiful descriptions of paradise, the beautiful and spiritually uplifting talks about Jannah. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you and I the highest levels of paradise. Now, on our journey to paradise, in our description of paradise, we want to pause and talk about one of the keys to paradise. One of the things that will help you and I in this life before the next. And it will help you on the day of resurrection in a great amount of rewards and faith and steadfastness. And this is the concept and the issue of tawakkul, reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a very beautiful topic. Now the word itself, when you look at the linguistic definition, it comes from the three letters, waw, kaf, and lam. And this means to give control to, to leave your control, to give it to someone else, so that you can rely on this person, to have confidence in another. So tawakkul means to train and to teach yourself to give over, to, re to rely on, and to have full confidence in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you talk about the jurisprudential definition, the Islamic definition, it comprises of three main things. The first is trusting Allah. Trusting Allah. The second is depending on Allah. And the third is accepting the results, the outcome of whatever it is that you're depending on Him for, regardless of whether you think it's good or bad. So trusting Allah, depending on Allah, and being content with the outcome, accepting the results. Now when you talk about trusting and depending, we know people in our lives who you may trust this person very, very easily. They're trustworthy, but they're not very reliable. You cannot rely upon them. You know some people that you can rely on, but you don't really trust them. You don't confide in them. And you know people that you cannot rely on and you cannot trust and then you might meet some rare people that you can always rely on, you can always trust. And they're always few in number. Now when it comes to our relationship with Allah, Allah is the one that we can always rely on and we can always trust. And we never have to worry that Allah would not come through for us. Because anytime you turn your heart towards Allah and you are sincere, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will come to you manyfold, meaning He will do so much more for you than that one step you took towards Allah. Tawakkul trusting and relying upon Allah includes being patient through hardships. Think of the hardships that you go through. How much do you trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That He's planning something good for you. How much do you assume good of Him? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. The test that will come your way will be on your level. It will be something that you can handle because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what you can handle. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to give you more than you can bear. And when you think of an example of our times, a huge example that affects the masses, this is the example of war, the example of oppression and killing. And so you look at the examples around the world and you see the Muslims getting killed in other parts of the world. They need tawakkul at this point. They need to rely upon Allah and to trust Allah, that Allah is taking care of them, that this is a trial that will bring them closer to Allah. How much do you assume good of Allah? How much do you assume good of what was decreed for you? How patient are you with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is decreeing? Sometimes a trial, a test will be prolonged. So what do you need if the test is prolonged? You need even more tawakkul. Because you might make dua for something or you might be harmed by someone for a long time and you're making dua and this is bringing you closer to Allah. But what happens if a month goes by or six months or a year or three years or five years go by? How long will you be patient for and trust Allah? This is the test. Some people, unfortunately, when a test comes their way, they cannot wait a year. They cannot wait two years. So they end up giving up on their hope in Allah. They even sometimes, they give up their faith in Allah. 
They lose hope. But when you are tested, you need to have trust in the promise and the victory of Allah at all times. So the believers, what were they saying when they were being tested? What were they saying? So they were saying, when is the victory of Allah coming? وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعَ What do they say? مَتَى نَصْرُ الله. The believers and their fall and the prophet, they, not this prophet, other prophets, they were saying, when is the victory of Allah coming? When will it come? أَلَا إِنَّ نَصْرَ اللَّهِ قَرِيبٌ Verily the victory and the trust and the uh, fulfillment of Allah is nearby. But you have to trust Allah. You have to be patient for as long as it requires. As long as it requires. And the longer you wait and the longer you're more patient, the greater your status will be with Allah and the more purified you are of your sins. Now another thing is that when you go through a hardship, what do you think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do you question Allah when you're going through a difficulty? Or do you question yourself on how you can be patient? Do you question yourself and how many sins you've been committing and these are the result perhaps of your sins? Do you try to get closer to Allah or are you pushed farther away? Because if you're pushed farther away, then perhaps it's a punishment. But if you become closer to Allah, then perhaps it's a test and you're purified. Now, think about all the times you've seen a child crying. When you see a very young child crying. Now this child is worrying. They're so worried, perhaps the child has some toy or something that broke, for example. Now you as an adult, as a grown-up, you know that the child is crying and they're worrying because the child doesn't know any better. It's not really a big deal. So as an adult, you start to comfort the child. You start to help the child. They support you and they trust you and they're comforted and consoled by you. But as you grow older, as you go older, grow older and go through more experiences in life and go through more hardships in life, the test will be at your level for your experience, for your age, for you, customized for you. So now you have all of these new struggles. And many people as they're grown, growing up, as they're adults now, they start to realize that trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is similar in a way where He is comforting you. He is the one that's comforting you. وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلِ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ And وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلِ الْمُتَوَكِّلُونَ Those who believe, they should rely upon Allah. Those who have trust and tawakkul, they should trust Allah. So as an adult, if you are not uh, maintaining yourself, if you are losing hope through your trial, through your hardship, through this difficulty, then now you're being placed back in the shoes of the child. Now you're crying and you're not realizing any better. You're not thinking any better. You're not aware that outside of this bubble of yours, this struggle of yours, Allah was trying to comfort you. So trust in Allah, rely upon Allah, and give your matters and hand over your affairs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You needed, you needed the adult or the grown-up as a child to comfort you. Now you're an adult and you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to constantly console you and comfort you. And so when you're going through this hardship, oftentimes somebody will come to you when you're sick, as I am right now. Somebody will say, Tahurun insha'Allah, right? Purification by the will of Allah. What does it mean, purification? When you go through a hardship and you're patient, that hardship purifies you of your sins. Do you know, my dear brothers and sisters, even if you're anxious or you're stressed out or a thorn pricks you, something small bothers you and you're patient with Allah, it's a purification of your sins. And we have many sins we need to be purified of. So now you're going through this hardship and you have trust in Allah and your sins are being purified. Purified means that after the hardship, after this ibtila, you're going to come out after this fitna as a stronger person. So you go through a fitna, a tribulation, and you come out stronger, you come out better. And when you are patient, and you succeed, and you're healed, or you get over this hardship, now you're at a stronger level, now you're more faithful in Allah. And every time you go through a hardship, and you're trusting Allah, your patience for Allah, and it goes away, now you're even stronger, your faith is increased, you're closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبَ Whoever puts his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will be enough for you. Allah will be sufficient for you. Allah will take care of you. He is everything that you need and more. Trust Allah. Trust in the promise of Allah. We mentioned in a previous episode the example of a man whose wife had passed away. Now this man was a scholar of his times, from the times of Bani Israel. And this was narrated by Muhammad ibn Ka'ab rahimahullah. Now this, this so-called scholar, his wife passed away and suddenly he loses hope in everything. His wife dies and he loses hope in everything. So what does he do? He isolates himself from the people for a long time. He cannot get over the death of his wife. So a wise woman 
comes to the house and she speaks to the guard. She says, I need to speak to the scholar. He says, you cannot speak to the scholar. He's still mourning. She says, I need to speak to the scholar. It's very important. I have a question. He says, you cannot. He's not talking to anyone. She says, I have a question that only he can answer. This is very important. And people are waiting for the answer. So finally, the guard goes in and, and he tells the scholar. The scholar says, okay, let her inside. This old woman comes inside. And she tells the scholar, I want to ask you a question. I had a neighbor who gave me some jewelry to borrow. She gave me some jewelry to borrow. And I wore it and I loved it. Now she's asking for the jewelry to be returned. Do I have to return it to her? And the scholar says, yes, of course. She says, but she gave it to me for such a long time. And I enjoyed it so much, I'm attached to it. He says, then you should be even more grateful that she allowed you to keep it for so long out of her kindness. So you should be grateful to return it to her. She said, then my servant of Allah, oh servant of Allah, how then are you not patient? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you something and he loaned it to you and then he took it away when he willed. Inna lillah wa inna ilahi raja'un. To Allah we belong, to him is our return. So your wife was a, a loan from Allah. The people in your life are a gift from Allah. When they're taken away, you should be grateful that Allah gave them to you for such a long time. And the scholar, he was moved by this, this example that she gave him and he came back to the people. He came back to the people. So you ask yourself, how much do you trust Allah? Think of a time in which you had to trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He helped you. You said, I'm going to rely upon Allah. Every single day we recite the same verses. When you pray your prayers, this salah that will take you to Jannah. When you pray and you say, At least 17 times a day. 17 times a day you recite this ayah. What do you think of when you recite this ayah? It is you, Allah, that we worship and it is you that we depend on. Do you really depend upon Allah? Do you really act like you depend on Allah? This ayah, every time you recite it, you should think about it. And you should think about every verse that you recite. Because this will increase your iman, this will increase your tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you trust Allah, you have to trust Allah fully. When you depend on Allah, you depend on Allah completely. And you accept the results as they are. So you're going through a hardship, a trial, and you don't realize that this trial, it could be that this is something good for you, but you don't know. You might hate something, but it might be so good for you. And you might love something. And it's actually really bad for you. Allah knows best and you do not know. Allah is managing your affairs for you. Trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with all matters in all regards. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase our trust in Him. We're going to take a short break inshallah ta'ala. We'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Scale of justice will be broke before me. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome back from the break. Before we took a short break, we started talking about the beautiful concept of tawakkul. And as we said, tawakkul requires you to trust Allah, that He is taking care of you, to trust in Him, that what's happening to you is something that is good for you, even if you don't see it. And we mentioned it's to depend upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To rely upon Him knowing that He will take care of you. Knowing that after this, something good will be replaced. Something good will replace what you're going through. To depend on Allah that He will relieve you of your hardship. And the third is to accept the results of whatever happens, regardless of what you perceive it to be. Now, we want to mention some ways to attain tawakkul. How do you and I attain tawakkul? Let's mention four steps. Four steps, inshallah, to attain tawakkul, reliance and trust in Allah. Number one is don't be lazy. Don't be lazy. So some people don't realize that you have to use your God-given faculties. You have to use what you have. Can you say, I'm going to relax and I'm just going to have tawakkul? Allah will take care of me. I'm just going to sit here. I'm not going to work. I'm not going to study. Allah will take care of me. So don't be lazy. Remember the hadith of the Bedouin man who came and he tied or he left his camel. And the Prophet ﷺ said, why didn't you tie your camel? He said, I'm depending on Allah. Tawakkul. He said, tie the camel and depend upon Allah. You have to do your absolute best and then and with it, you depend upon Allah. So you cannot say, I'm not going to take care of my car. I'm going to leave it somewhere with the keys inside of it and I'm going to allow someone to steal it. But I'm going to have tawakkul so Allah will protect it. You have to do what you can. You have to go to the farthest extent possible with your efforts, with what Allah gave you. And then you depend upon Allah 
and whatever happens, you're patient with it. Whatever happens, you're patient with it. So we have the other hadith reported by Tirmidhi, the Prophet ﷺ said, if you had relied upon Allah as you should rely upon Him, then Allah would provide for you as He provides for the birds who wake up hungry in the morning and they return back with full stomachs at the time of dusk. Now, this bird, the Prophet ﷺ is telling us, it's relying upon Allah, but it leaves its nest, it comes back with a full stomach. So the bird, what is it doing? Is the bird sitting on its, in its nest, it's just sitting back and relaxing and saying, I have tawakkul. Allah will take care of me, but I'm not going to do anything. Allah will take care of me. This is so misguided in the mentality of some people. And some deviant groups think like this, that you can have tawakkul and not do anything, and not do anything at all. And so you need to have tawakkul, absolutely. But you need to do what you can do, as the Prophet ﷺ told us in these two narrations. So tie your camel. And as the bird does, the bird leaves. Is the bird panicking and flying around in circles in chaos? Is the bird complaining and crying? Or is the bird going out there and doing work and searching for food? It's doing its best and Allah will take care of the rest. That bird is not even waiting for other birds to do the work for it. It's not relying upon other people as well. So that bird is going out and it's trusting Allah and it's doing what it possibly can. And so number one, with tawakkul and relying upon Allah, don't be lazy. Do your best and Allah will take care of the rest. Number two, do not become arrogant or proud. Do not become arrogant or proud thinking that you are independent of Allah, thinking that you can earn things yourself. And this is a big trick and trap of shaitan because shaitan is arrogant. So when a person thinks, and they're at this stage, they think, I have done this myself. I've earned this grade. I've earned this career. I've earned this wealth. I've created this business. When someone starts to think that they have done things themselves without the mercy and the will and the blessings of Allah, this person is straying down a dangerous path, the path of shaitan. So when you want to realize, when you have this thought, and you want to realize that Allah is taking care of you, always humble yourself and say, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. If Allah did not will, this would not have happened. If Allah did not give you blessings, this would not have happened. Even if you didn't make dua and something good happened to you, it doesn't mean you did it yourself. Allah is still blessing you because Allah could have prevented it in so many ways. When you become arrogant and think you've done it yourself, you're falling into the trap of the disbelievers. And we have the example of Qarun. He said, I have attained all of this wealth on my own with my knowledge, my faculties. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed everything that he had. So do not become arrogant because arrogance is something that is a trait of shaitan. It leads to the hellfire. Number three, go for the fruit. Go for the fruit of tawakkul. Ibn Rajab al-Hamli rahimullah says, the fruit of tawakkul is the acceptance of Allah's decree. Whoever leaves his affairs to Allah, relies upon Allah, and then accepts whatever he has been given, has truly relied upon Allah. This is real tawakkul. This is true tawakkul. Remind yourself that believing in Al-Qadr, believing in the decree of Allah is one of the pillars of your faith. It's part of your Iman. Tell yourself that whatever will happen, will happen, and that you can only rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah will do as He wishes. And there's always khair in it, if you are a true believer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who is able to do all things, will never let something bad happen to you, even if you fear it, even if you think it's bad for you. There is a blessing in it. Everything that happens to the believer, to the mu'min, is khair. And so you're patient with it. You're patient with it. And so Allah, the Prophet ﷺ tells us, فَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُ So this is good for you. You had a big reward in it. And Allah will give you something better. And if something good happens to you, then shakar. فَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُ He thanks Allah for it. So this is something that was good for this person. So during your life, you might be thinking you're going down this path. You're going to do this action. You're going to follow this idea, this ideology, this career, whatever it may be. And then you find out that you cannot go down this path. Something happens. So now you have to go on a detour in life. Now you have to go down a different path. Now when you go down this detour, realize that this is a test of your faith in Allah, your trust in Allah. Do you trust that Allah will take you on a detour that will be much better for you? Because sometimes somebody, only years later, they'll look back and say, SubhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly was planning for me. Allah was taking care of me. I should have trusted Him more. So number three is go for the fruit, accept the result of whatever happens, as long as you're patient and relying upon Allah. 
Number four, remember that Allah is Al-Wakil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate and the best friend, the best trustee, the best one that you can put your affairs with. So everything that Allah decrees for us is good. He disposes of our affairs as He wishes. He is su sufficient for everything that we need. فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ so aren't you lucky, aren't you glad that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking care of you? Aren't you glad that Allah is the one managing your affairs? Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says, if you knew how Allah managed your affairs for you in the unseen, your heart would melt out of love for Him. Ya Allah, Allah is taking care of you more than you can imagine. Somebody might become ill and they might go to the doctor for a severe illness. They might say, why is Allah doing this to me? They might question Allah and this is wrong. But then they find out, the doctor checks them up and finds out there's another problem. And this has happened so many times. And they say, Alhamdulillah. But why does it take you so long to be grateful to Allah? The test is at the time of calamity, the time of hardship. And the test can be something good and something bad. Meaning, something that's difficult for your nafs, you might think it's bad for you. This is where patience comes in. And the test can also be something that is good for you. You might be given a lot of wealth or beauty or fame. But that's a test for you. That's a test for you. So even when you have something good, you are being tested with it. And some people don't realize that this is also a test. And so we have an example of a man who put his trust in Allah. And look at the results of the actions. One of the students of knowledge in our times was saying that he was in Mecca. He was praying in front of the Kaaba. He saw a man who looked very, very poor. His clothes were actually torn and very dirty. So it seemed like he had no home. He had no clothes, no wealth to buy new clothes. And he was very frail and very skinny, like he couldn't even afford food. And he was standing there and making dua to Allah, making so much dua to Allah. So this man who was saying the story, he says, I put my hands into my pocket, I reached into my pocket, and I grabbed five riyal, five riyal to give him as some kind of charity. He looked like he needed it. He said, so I put it in my hand, and I got closer to him. And as he was making dua, I reached out to him. I said, Assalamu Alaikum. When he shook my hand, as he was shaking my hand, I tried to give him the five riyal. He realized that there was money in my hand, that I was giving him money, a charity. And he, he grabbed his hand. He reacted. And this man is like, will you not take it? And the other man, he turned away and he didn't say anything. He started to make more dua. He continued back to his dua. So the student of knowledge says, I left him alone. He started to pray Salat al-Sunnah, the student of knowledge. And after, and while he was praying, he noticed the other man, the one who looked poor, he started looking at the student of knowledge. He was staring at him. So he says, as I was praying, I noticed him staring at me. And I finished Salah, and the man walks up to me and says, what were you going to give me? He says, it doesn't matter. You didn't accept it, so it doesn't matter. He says, no, by Allah, tell me, how much money were you going to give me? He says, don't swear by Allah. This matter is over with. I tried to help you. You rejected it. Why do you care? He says, I care because I was making dua to Allah just to get five riyal. This is all that I need to get home. I was making dua to Allah and you were grabbing my arm and giving me something. He says, how much were you going to give me? The student of knowledge was shocked. He says, I was going to give you five riyal, exactly what you were praying for. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. The man reacted and took his hand back. So he asked him, why did you react? Why did you reject it? He says, I rejected it because I was making dua for it. I was still making the dua for it and you were giving it to me. And I could not believe and could not comprehend that the dua was being accepted for me before I even finished saying it. The dua was being accepted so quickly. He says, I trusted Allah, but I just didn't realize it'd be that quick. Subhanallah. You make dua to Allah and you remember, وَإِذَا سَالَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قريب. Allah is nearby. Trust in the promise of Allah. Trust in the promise of Allah. This is your test to have faith in Allah. How much do you assume good of Allah? Indeed, Allah is nearby. But you have to assume good of it. You make dua to Allah and you assume that the dua is being answered. And keep assuming so and keep being happy and positive and optimistic with your dua. And make sure your heart is attentive with Allah. Attentive in your dua. That no matter what happens, I'm going to rely upon Allah, even if it seems difficult. You might hate it. You might think something is bad for you, but there is a blessing behind it. Try to look at the blessing. Try to find the optimistic side. 
for there will always be something good as long as you're always trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to summarize this concept of tawakkul, number one, put your trust in Allah al wakil Always rely upon Allah. وَإِذَا اسْتَعَنْتَ فَاسْتَعَنْ بِاللَّهِ So always rely upon Allah. Number two, use your God-granted faculties to do as much as you possibly can. Your best efforts. So if you want something done, you do your best efforts. You want to succeed in your school and your business. If you want to succeed in your exam, study for your exam. You have to study and put your trust in Allah. So you put your trust in Allah and you're studying. But if you only tr uh, trusted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you said, I'm going to have tawakkul and you don't study. And then you fail. You can only blame yourself for not putting in the efforts. Now what happens if you put your trust in Allah and you do your best efforts and you still fail in what you're trying to do? Your business fails. Your dua or your something is not accepted as you expected. So for example, your test, you failed it. Your exam, you failed it. But you had tawakkul and you were sincere and you did your best. This is number three. Believe in the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-qadr wa al-qadr. The divine decree of Allah. That when something good happens, praise Allah. When something difficult happens, be patient. Trust Allah. Say, قَدَّرَ اللَّهُ وَمَا شَاءَ فَعَلْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed and whatever He decreed, whatever He willed happens. So trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say to Allah, we belong to Him, we shall return. And know that everything for the believer is good. As long as you're always connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah to forgive us for our shortcomings and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us complete and full tawakkul reliance and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to make us strong through our difficulties and hardships and to make us grateful for the good things in our lives. We will see you next time inshallah ta'ala as we continue talking about the path to paradise. Jazakumullah khairan wa sallillahumma ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Now you shall have to explain your whole life span, span, span. What you did in the open and what you conceived From big to small shall today be revealed Your deeds shall then be Determine if you pass or fail